Welcome to this third Sunday in Lent as we progress towards Good Friday and Easter. We appreciate the welcoming of spring, of uh, the returning light, a season of contemplation and expectation. A few announcements. I want to highlight the uh, food challenge, the food challenge for Lent that the Eco Justice Committee has put for us. Uh, kind of a, a loony for Lent. We're attempting to um, put, put aside a loony a day during the 40 days of Lent that can go either towards food security in Aurelia or towards our garden project here at St. Paul's, helping to increase awareness about the importance of food security in our community and what we can do about it. This is our Lenten appeal for this year. In the last week, before we got shut down again, many people were able to get directories and your tax receipts and a newsletter. We discovered in the directories that there were some inconsistencies and uh, wrong pictures and so on. The inevitable uh, mix-ups that happened because of close downs during COVID and so on. So we'd like to correct that. We'd like your feedback in the next two weeks to get the right information and then we'll reissue the inside papers and uh, make those available to you so that we have the most current information we have. There will always be updates, but we'd like to start with the best copy that we can. We've been talking during Lent about treaties, and I'd love to find a time in weeks ahead to have a conversation with you about uh, the conversations I've been having with our Indigenous leaders and what it means for us. So stay tuned for a time to get together and talk about that. These are some of the announcements we have as part of our life and ministry at St. Paul's. Welcome to this time of worship in the third Sunday in Lent. We are on the journey towards Good Friday and Easter, the center point of our Christian faith. 
Without this understanding of Good Friday and Easter, we have little deep awareness of what Christianity means. So the journey through Lent invites us to reflect on its meaning and what it says to us in this day and age. On this journey, we have been reflecting on what treaties mean, our covenant with God, with each other, what that has meant throughout the centuries, how we've lived up to these ideals, how we've broken them, how we've reconciled, how we've understood what it means to acknowledge our faults, what we used to call our sinfulness. Now we seek reconciliation and new ways forward. So as we journey through Lent, we look at these ideals, we look at how we can continue to deepen this relationship, represented in Good Friday and the resurrection of Easter, a time of renewal for us all. So let us worship in this Lenten spirit of openness, of yearning towards the light. During Lent, we've been recognizing that Lent, Lente represents spring awakening. And so we have the candles to represent for us the increasing awakening of spring, awakening towards Easter. It's also from the French, meaning a time to go slow, to be reflective. So in this third week, we continue to light the way towards spring, the returning of the light, the opening of us. It's a journey that 
takes us towards the drama and the power of Holy Week and the resurrection, the, the light of Christ understood in a new way. So let us journey through this springtime being awakened by the light, holding that light on this journey through Lent. Uh, 
I'd like to welcome uh, Jeff Maneg, who was part of our service in December, uh, gave us the pipe ceremony, much appreciated. Jeff is the former chief of uh, Beaujolais First Nation on Christian Island and uh, a veteran from the armed forces and has taught Ojibwe in the Simcoe school system and uh, a teacher in many ways around the community. He's the co-manager of the Springwater Provincial Park, which is uh, co-managed and uh, part of a joint relationship uh, with the uh, First Nations folks there and uh, part of our Aurelia Truth and Reconciliation Commission and uh, we've worked together on a few projects over the last few years and I've appreciated your wisdom and uh, our work together. So uh, in, in, I would like to offer this tobacco uh, in a virtual way to you today as, as a gift uh, in mm -hmm. uh, asking <clears throat> for a conversation about uh, treaties. We have been at St. Paul's talking in the in this Lenten time about the meeting of covenant and treaty as uh, a commitment between our divine and human responsibilities to uh, work towards a, an ideal of uh, human relations that represents our uh, ultimate values of cooperation and being together. And uh, we recognize that this is a mixed history of ideals on one hand and broken relations and, and needing to overcome some of those uh, problems and, and differences throughout the, the centuries. And so I'm inviting different uh, leaders uh, from the Indigenous community to help us reflect on what treaty means for us, both historically and in today's world. So what does that mean for you, Jeff? Well, um, really not, not much different from, uh, from the, um, uh, the dictionary, uh, um, the, uh, uh, what the dictionary, uh, defines as treaty is, uh, uh, treaty is, uh, a relationship between two nations. And that's the only, the only way that it can be a treaty is between two nations. So I can't have a treaty with uh, Barry and Aurelia, for example. Um, and so, so my people, the Anishinaabek, who are called the Ojibwe, uh, we're also called Chippewa, uh, Mississauga, Algonquin, Salto, it just goes on and on. There are many names, but we've always called ourselves the Anishinaabek and we're always making treaties with the, uh, with the crown. And, and for, for our people in this region, we've been making treaties since uh, 1785, well, 1763, if you wanna go back to uh, uh, the uh, uh, Royal Pro Proclamation. Um, so we've been, uh, we've been involved because we had people go down to, uh, to Niagara to recommemorate this, the Treaty of 1763 and in, in 1764. And, and then 1785 is when we started doing uh, land-based treaties with the uh, with the crown, the British crown. And the first treaty was uh, just uh, north of Aurelia. Um, uh, it, it was called the Collins Treaty. And it was really a, a relationship to allow for passageway between Lake Ontario into Georgian Bay in 1785. Uh, this uh, passageway eventually became the Trent River system. But that, that treaty very specifically, uh, we agreed and everybody agreed that uh, it was to allow for passageway. There was not to be any settlement. And uh, unfortunately there was settlement along the way. And um, uh, many years ago, we started doing research on this uh, and we found all the documents and the archives uh, related to that treaty. And what, what we found was that, um, that there was no payment given either. Uh, along with the land just being taken away. So we, uh, we started a process of, uh, of, cl of claiming um, for that loss uh, to Canada. And there was a through a land claim process back in the 1980s. And we settled that claim in, um, 
in uh, 1999. And so for the three communities of Christian Island, Rama and Georgian Island, who were once one community, um, we received, um, I think it was something like $3.8 million. I can't remember the exact figure, but it was, it was about that because that's what the, the goods would have been worth back then. And so, yeah, so then we, um, we put that money away and that money's still doing work in, in my community because it's, uh, it hasn't been touched. It was put into a trust and it's generating revenue every year. Um, so that would have given us a leg up back way back then, uh, just, as, just as well as it did today. Um, and that's really what we were looking to do. So we, um, through our research, we, we uh, rediscovered the, uh, the worth of, of what anything was back then. We hired economists and they uh, figured out what the, uh, the worth of all those goods were and that land loss would have been. And uh, they recalculated that to today's figures or 99 figure, 1999 figures. And that's how we arrived at that settlement. Um, and, and so we, we kept making treaties right up through until uh, 1923, which, uh, which was the latest treaty that we, that we did. And um, again, uh, through all those, uh, all those treaties, every one of those treaties had been breached by uh, the British Crown and later Canada as well. Um, and for that, we received uh, an apology, um, uh, but also a recognition that uh, everything underlying uh, the 1923 Williams Treaty, so all of our, um, all of our pre-Confederation treaties before Canada became a country, were all still recognized and they're still living, breathing documents. And uh, that's, what, that's what people need to understand is that they're still alive. They're, they're, not, they're not documents that you can just simply uh, forget and do away with. Uh, that was a relationship in my language. Um, when, when we talk about uh, uh, Nukuinen, uh, that that's what it actually means. And when we, when we talk about our treaties, Nukuinen is that working relationship. And that's, that's the way we describe them to be that working relationship. So that's how I, how I understand treaties to be. So when we think about this uh, this historic understanding of, of treaties, it, it offers us this kind of, uh, uh, both this ideal, but the practical realities that you're describing. It's, it's actual negotiation about how we live on this land together. And uh, we find in our current way of thinking, you know, as our uh, as settler culture has dominated, so, uh, things over the last 100, 200 years at least, then this idea of treaty has been kind of lost and somewhat denigrated uh, by um, you know, more recent government thinking, I think, uh, an attempt to, to lose that. And so it's been hard work to, to bring it forward, hasn't it? Uh, have folks remember the importance of these treaty relationships? Uh, yes, it, and, it, and we've we've had to use the uh, the judicial system, Canada's judiciary, in order to have uh, our grievances uh, recognized. So, when you think about it, it's sort of a backward process because um, we're making claim to land that we already own. When you think about land claims, and that's the crazy thing about it, but we do we do go through the process because that's the only thing available to us right now. That's the only avenue we have, and so we've we've always done it with the uh, in um, um, uh, recognition that uh, back when I was a chief uh, around the table when we sat around the table we talked about um, what is it that we're after. One of the things that we we said at the beginning was that we're not looking to displace people. And that was never the that was never the case. All we were looking to do was to receive the compensation that we rightfully should have received at the original transaction. Uh, if the original transaction had uh, been fully achieved, uh, then we wouldn't have to be in that position. We wouldn't have to be there asking for that. But that's what we've had to do. Um, so we said originally that we're not going to displace people because uh, two wrongs don't make a right. And it's as simple as that. And those are part of our teachings as well as, as the teachings of the Larsish Society as well. 
uh, when, when we when we talk about that relationship, uh, even the Bible talks about uh, about relationships and loving thy neighbor. Um, you know, there are constant passages throughout the Bible that talk about that, and and uh, the, the the teachings in in our society are no different. Uh, we are all looking to make uh, the the same thing. We are all looking to create a good person, and um, and and we are no different in in what we are trying to achieve in those relationships or or those treaties. So do you see in our current uh, situation and here in Simcoe County some examples of us working on this both the reconciling path but also creating the legal structures and the the relationships that we can work forward like is your work at Springwater a representation of moving forward or how is that relationship yeah, well, it's 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 a it's a recognition that that we need to understand each other in a better way. And a lot of what we're doing at, at Springwater Provincial Park is is uh, we partnered with uh, the area school boards, and we're teaching about us. We're teaching about uh, the the indigenous people and who we are today, who we were in the past, uh, so that there's a better understanding. So that we have young people who are going through the system today. Who will 20 years from now be the adults that will be dealing with these issues because they'll still be there uh, they were there when i was a kid they were there when my father was a kid there doesn't it doesn't appear to be any real uh, movement toward settling them so we know that they're going to be there so we have to understand each other in a better way and that's what we're attempting to do and i think had we done that when the first boats arrived on the shores we would have been in a better position uh, today it's it's a little more difficult because um, uh, grievances uh, tend to take on a different life of their own and uh, if, if uh, people are not given the proper history uh, then they will uh, um, they will create their own narrative and I think that's what's happened is that uh, there's a new narrative that has been created about indigenous people um, have everything we've given them everything um, when actual fact is no we don't have anything we have uh, uh, you know uh, zero 0.4% uh, of the land base that we that we originally had right. um, so it's it's it, the, the old narrative has to be has to be turned away the old narrative has to be changed so that people understand each other in a better way yeah yeah I can't agree more in terms of you know what we're attempting to do uh, is tell a new story about Canada's deeper history of us as different peoples uh, coming to live on this land and that our early history has some, you know, appreciations of what that meant and that uh, the kind of colonial period and, the, and that kind of current thinking is a distortion from the treaties and, the, and our, our ways of being together on the land and that we're seeking to find new ways that all of us who live on this Turtle Island can live here in prosperous and harmonious and have good services and education and all of the things that any people of a land would desire for themselves. And uh, so I, I appreciate your efforts at that. It's, it's, it's gotta be challenging. And, and back the other way, back the other way, Reverend, because um, I like I like what's happening at your church. I like what's happening with your congregation because it's those kinds of things that would help help to make that change. And if if we did this all across the country, if people started uh, uh, trying to do this even by themselves, then then we would we would be able to move forward on these issues in a much better way. But it's not happening, and th that needs that needs leadership, and that leadership has to be. Uh, uh, probably a grassroots based um, um, leadership. Uh, I think I think that, that that's the only way because we've waited long enough for the politicians to do it and politicians get mired in in, uh, in the uh, the legalities of everything and and so we don't really have any move it or, or it's, it's glacial if we're, if we're doing trying to make any progress. Um, but what we can do on the ground is is, uh, is is make those changes in a in a much quicker and in a much easier way, in a good way, and, and then I think we'll find that that uh, the politicians will eventually begin to move because the people have already done that, the people have already uh, started to make that that transition, 
and that's what needs to happen is um you know it's 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 like what i was saying we have to change the narrative and that has to start somewhere well this is a big conversation and we only have a short time in our our service for this but i, I really appreciate you having come to saint paul's uh, before christmas and uh, again today in this virtual way uh, it's uh, it's good to have you as a friend of our community and and we want to reciprocate in the in the ways that we can be friends in this new new story and new path forward so appreciate you being here jeff well thank you thank you as well me which thank you so much Let us draw our hearts and minds together. Let us pray. Holy Creator, Spirit Divine, we come to you today with our hopes and concerns, our reflections and our dreams. We yearn for healthy relationship with Spirit, with each other, and with the whole natural world. We think of the challenges being faced by people throughout our world people in Myanmar facing deadly force in their efforts to hold on to democracy, those working with Black Lives Matter to turn the tide of racism and violence against people of color, the ongoing work by medical staff and all frontline workers to support and treat those of us who have contracted COVID-19. We pray for the support of our leaders who are working to find ways through these complex situations. In Canada and right here in Orillia, we have a growing awareness of the promises and treaties made and broken with Indigenous peoples. We know from our stories of Jesus' life that we as community are called to build new relationships and find reconciliation. We yearn to follow the spirit that invites that renewal and long for the courage and creativity that that will require of us. Here at St. Paul's, we hold in prayer 
those who have lost a loved one, are facing illness, or are dealing with isolation and worry that comes from the ongoing threat of the pandemic. We also celebrate the community we share and the support we are able to give and receive from each other through Zoom calls and small acts of kindness. With gratitude and hope, we offer our thankfulness. In all things, your divine goodness surrounds us and holds us always. Amen.
The scripture reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John. Uh, Jesus has entered the temple in Jerusalem as part of the preparation for Passover. Reading from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. May this reading add to our understanding of God's will for us today. In my conversation with Jeff, he calls us to a bottom-up revolution, a different way of organizing ourselves from the bottom up, all of us together, taking a new look at how we can live into treaties together. He's calling for this approach after the long history that he describes of First Peoples having to uh, fight through the court system to get back to the treaty relations that were established a few hundred years ago, and that uh, that's been a long, painful process. It's much better if there's a bottom-up approach, and he appreciates that St. Paul's is part of a bottom-up approach of looking differently at our relationships and how we can go forward. The biblical story is one of Jesus doing a bottom-up kind of revolution in the temple culture. It's a story of him turning the tables, of uh, resisting the status quo. This is probably a real story of Jesus because it's in all four of the gospel stories, in the synoptics, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in those stories, it's at the end of their stories, at the Passover time, uh, before uh, the Last Supper, when Jesus comes to Jerusalem for the Passover. For John, who's writing in the latter part of the first century, about 80 years after the time of Jesus, the story doesn't need to follow that chronology. The story for him is a theological assertion about who Jesus is. So for John, he's asserting a few different ways of holding up the life of Jesus as being the one as the Messiah. His first miracle story, my favorite, I think, is him turning water into wine. He then goes to this story of Jesus turning over the tables in the temple. This represents a resistance to the temple culture that was around. And the, the references to the temple being built for 46 years and how it can be destroyed and how can Jesus rise, raise it again in three days is symbolic language. The temple had been destroyed about 20 years earlier in, uh, the, in 70, uh, year 70 of the common era uh, by the Romans. And so the people would have known that. They'd known how long it had been in building and its destruction. 
And so how could you uh, resurrect a building like that in, uh, after such a long development? The reference then to rising in three days, of course, refers to Jesus' resurrection, the story that would be present to them about his death and resurrection. And so it symbolizes this shift from temple culture, where, Jesus, where the idea of God residing in the temple, to this idea of God residing in Jesus, the Christ, uh, an incarnational image, a whole new way of understanding the divine in the Jesus story as part of who Jesus is and uh, was for the world. So it makes that kind of assertion. It's a powerful story because it's one of disruption, of God in this disruptor, this person who has this bias and this love for those at the bottom of society, not the temple elite. Uh, in their case, the, the temple elite were uh, Roman-appointed people, and the whole uh, temple system of coming and offering sacrifices had a revenue stream for Rome in it. So Jesus turning over uh, the tables disrupted the revenue stream for Rome and for the appointed priests, the elite there. So Jesus is disrupting this elitist approach and calling for um, a bottom-up understanding of concern for the poor and for the widow and the prisoner and those marginalized. This is a revolutionary understanding of God with us and God's bias for those who are marginalized. We've seen this tension down through the stories of this covenantal relationship. So in these last few weeks, I've been talking about this divine human covenant treaty relationship. The image of Noah and the ark and God's covenant with all of creation to not destroy all of creation. The story of Abraham and Sarah. These are tribal people, just like tribal nations here in North America, tribal nations around the world. This covenant of the divine with the people in their nations and their well-being and the back and forth of falling in and out of a relationship. And then this story of the divine with Jesus, a new form of divine human relation, this solidarity. So we come down in our conversations to the, the treaties that we have had with the first peoples, the covenant relationship of a higher ideal, how our nations from Europe and the nations that existed here for thousands of years entered into treaty relations of how they would work nation to nation to respect each other. But like the other stories through our history, they get corrupted, they get changed, human avarice, human uh, ego, the variety of things that come into it, and covenants get broken. And uh, we see the ideals uh, come to a different level of misunderstanding and brokenness. So I think of my own family history in this story, in this Canadian picture. I think of my ancestor, John Reeve, coming in the 1850s as a poor working man from England uh, coming here looking for a new life, getting a job at the Schliemann Brewery in Guelph as a, a laborer there and working his way into getting a plot of land and uh, that whole story of growth and family expansion and land and the leading up to this current generation. I don't imagine that he was conscious of the treaty relations that had happened at the more elite level. He 
was probably a beneficiary. He was a beneficiary of this a relationship and the, the brokenness of the relationship and probably the stereotypes that uh, supported this breaking of relationship. Just as our church, the United Church, uh, in our thinking, we came on board with this colonial mentality of our way as being better than the indigenous ways and our belief that we were helping people uh, here to be like us, that this had a superior value. So now that we know in this era what this has caused, the, the brokenness for First People and the brokenness of our treaty relations, we have to look at it anew. We are no longer ignorant. And so we have to make decisions. Are, are we like Jesus, able to turn the table on the status quo, the systems that entrench an unjust way of doing it? Are we the ones that stand around the temple tisk tisking Jesus and his disruption of things? Or do we follow in the path of Jesus and overturn the tables, ask for forgiveness, seek reconciliation, Ask for a new divine human relation that includes us all. Reform treaties for all of us that enable us to live on this land in just and responsible ways so that we can all benefit as God's people, as creators, peoples responsible for this land and for each other. May we take this revolutionary path this bottom-up approach that Jesus invites us into. Oh, 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 oh,
So we have journeyed in this Lenten time towards a new understanding of ourselves as treaty people, of coming into a divine human understanding of our ideals of how we want to live on this planet together in good relations. And so we ask Creator to bless us on this journey. We ask Jesus to walk with us in these challenging times. And we ask to be embraced by the spirit of love that holds, nurtures, and inspires each one of us. May this be so. Amen. Oh.